Hey guys, this is Mrs. Harbin, and this is Pre-Cal Chapter 5. We are working with different types of equations, and in this lesson, which is 5.3, we'll be working with radical equations. Our life application for this unit is this. In order to understand and solve for the unknown, the student must build on a firm mathematical foundation. Just as in his daily life, he must seek to be a spiritual judge who subjects all things to the scriptures to discern what is right and wrong. And we've been talking about this connection in our notes here about building on a firm foundation and using the things that we know to be true to address more difficult problems and difficult questions. The same is true in math as it is in life. We've got to build on the firm foundation of scriptures so that we can decide for ourselves what is right and wrong when we face more difficult or challenging problems. Our lesson objective for today is this. The student will solve radical equations and use domains and ranges to check for extraneous solutions of radical equations. Now let's talk really quickly about what a radical equation is. A radical equation is an equation containing a variable as a part of a radicand. So we know an equation has an equal sign. And hopefully you remember that a radicand is the expression that's under the root symbol. So when you have a variable as part of that radicand, we call that a radical equation. Now, you see here there's an anatomy of a radical, and there are some different words here that you may not quite know. So you should know that the expression under the root symbol is called the radicand. And you see here that they say this is the degree, but most of the time we're going to refer to this as the index. But you may also hear degree. And then we have been calling this the radical symbol. However, you can see here that the radical symbol can be broken into two parts, the radical part and the vinculum part. Now, we won't be using this terminology, but I wanted to put it out there so that you guys, uh, as you're coming across different textbooks or as you see different questions, this is something that you've at least heard before. But for our purposes, we're going to call this the radical symbol. We'll call this the radicand, and this is going to be referred to as the index. This right here will be referred to as the index. When solving a radical equation, the first thing that we want to do is isolate the radical. So get the radical by itself and then raise both sides to the power of the index. Why would we do that? We know that raising something to a power eliminates or is the inverse operation of the index. So if we wanted to get rid of a square root, we would raise it to a power of two. To get rid of a cubed root, we would raise the whole expression here to a power of three and so forth and so on. You may need to repeat this process a couple of times until you've actually solved for the variable. Because raising things to powers does introduce the possibility for extraneous solutions, we do need to make sure that we check the solutions at the end with our original equation. So let's try one. Let's solve for x. We have the cubed root of x squared minus 1 equals 15. Our first step is to isolate the radical. So the first thing we want to do is add 1 to both sides. We need to get this radical expression here by itself. And when we do that, we have the cubed root of x squared equals 16. We then want to raise the expression to the power of the index. Our index is 3, so we're going to raise it to the third power. But whatever we do to one side, we have to do to the other. So we're going to take the 16 and raise it to the third power as well. The third root raised to the third power. Those two things undo each other. So we're left with x squared equals 16 cubed, or x squared equals 4,096. Now to solve for x in order to undo, a, uh, an exponent of 2, we need to take a root of 2, or a square root. So if we take the square root of one side, we've got to do the same thing to the other side, and we get x equals plus or minus 64. After we've gotten that answer, we want to check both of those things in. We want to take a positive 64 and plug it back into our original equation. So positive cubed root of positive 64 minus 1 equals 15, and the cubed root of negative 64 minus 1 equals 15. Remember that you cannot take the square root of a negative number. However, you can take the cubed root of a negative number. So when we plug both of those back in, both solutions do check. They do work. Let's go ahead and solve for the square root of x minus 5 equals x minus 7. Step 1 is to isolate the radical. And as you see, the radical is all by itself on the left side of the equation. 
Step two is raise the radical to the power of the index. Now remember that when our index is not stated, when it's invisible, it's actually two, it's a square root. So we're going to raise our expression to a power of two. Whatever we do on one side, we have to do to the other. Now, remember that we don't distribute or we can't distribute exponents to two different terms. So we can't distribute this and make it x squared minus 49. Remember that we're squaring this whole binomial. So x minus seven squared is the same thing as x minus seven times x minus seven. And in order to square that, we're going to have to multiply those binomials using foils, using a box method, using whatever method you prefer. When we do both of those things, we get x minus five on the left and x squared minus 14x plus 49 on the right. From here, we need to solve for x. And we have a square term and a linear term. So that should be a hint to us that we are going to set this equal to zero and try to solve for x using factoring. So we'll move both the x and the negative five. We'll get rid of those on the left, minus x plus five, and we get zero equals x squared minus 15x plus 54. From here, we are going to try and factor, and this quadratic is factorable. So we have x minus nine times x minus six. According to our zero product property, we can set each of those equal to zero, and when we do that, we get x equals nine or x equals six. Now, we did have to square some things here. Whenever we square things, we introduce the possibility for extraneous results. So let's go ahead and plug those back in and check our solutions. When we plug in nine, we get the square root of nine minus five equals nine minus seven, which is the square root of four equals two, and two does equal two. So that solution checks. When we plug in six, we get the square root of six minus five equals six minus seven. So that's the square root of one equals negative one. The square root of one is one. So one equals negative one, that's not true. So that is an extraneous solution. So we would exclude that. Remember that when we are looking at this square root symbol here, what we're wanting to check the principal root. So as we're checking things, we're checking the principal root. Let's solve for x in this one, x squared plus five x plus three, all under the square root symbol, minus the square root of x squared plus three x equals one. Now we can't isolate both radicals. Our first step is isolate the radicals, so we're just going to isolate one of the radicals. So we're going to isolate this one, which means we're going to get rid of this one. So we'll add the root x squared plus three x to the left, and whatever we do to the left, we have to also do to the right, so we get this expression, or this equation, the square root of x squared plus five x plus three equals one plus the square root of x squared plus three x. Step two was to square or raise it to a power of the index, our index is two. So we're going to raise this to the power of two, but whatever we do to one side, we have to do to the other side. So we have to raise this also to two. Now this is really just a binomial, one and two. So when we square our binomials, remember we can't distribute that exponent. We're going to have to multiply using foiling or the box method or whichever method you prefer. When we do that, on the left we get x squared plus 5x plus 3, and on the right we get 1 plus 2 times the square root of x squared plus 3x plus x squared plus 3x. Okay, from here then we're going to simplify, and then we'll isolate the remaining radicals. We have another radical, so we have to repeat the process. To isolate this radical, right now it's being multiplied by 2, so the first thing we need to do is divide by 2. When we divide both sides by 2, we get x plus 1 equals the square root of x squared plus 3x. Then we'll raise our radical to the power of the index, so that means the index is 2. We'll raise it to a power of 2. Whatever we do to one side, we have to do to the other. So that means we'll be multiplying this binomial here, and we get x squared plus 2x plus 1 equals x squared plus 3x. Again, we see square terms here and linear terms. Uh, we might have to solve this by factoring, or we might, have to, we might just be able to solve for x. I notice that my linear terms are just one apart, so I'm going to subtract x squared from both sides, 
and that gives me 2x plus 1 equals 3x. And when I subtract 2x from both sides, I get 1 equals x. So I did not have to factor that time around. I could have, I just combined and simplified and got that 1 was equal to x. Oh, I lost my cursor here. There we go. All right, when we plug that back in, the solution x equals 1 checks. Remember, we do have to check especially when we introduce or when we have squared things because we introduce or can introduce an extraneous solution. So always be sure to check. All right, guys, that's it for today. Today we solved radical equations and we used domains and ranges to check for extraneous solutions of radical equations. Remember that when we are checking, we're checking for the principal root. So we want to make sure that our answers work with the principal root of the radical. All right, if you guys have any questions, write those down and ask me next class.